We are going to be in James again. Praise God. James 1.12 today. James 1.12. So if you would open your Bibles up, James 1.12. I have that kind of stage presence. James 1.12, if you guys would be read along with me here. It says, um, I'm reading from the HCSB, so it might be a little bit different for you. It says, a man who endures trials is blessed, because when he passes the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Today in James, we're, he's going to teach us that our entire lives are a big test. But unlike this, which is ingenious... You can't cheat on this test. We're commanded by James to look at our struggles as blessings and to understand that everything we have must be put into its proper place. So last week we saw that everything, including our possessions and our money, can become idols. But we learned that even our stuff is supposed to be used to further God's kingdom. And this is the test of our lives. To use our attitudes, our emotions, our possessions, our money, and everything in between to bring the love of God to the world, and this includes our trials and how we reflect on our trials, how we act towards our trials. We all have, will, or are suffering right now, but how we react to these trials and how we respond to this suffering is a matter of choice, and to choose rightly, we need a God-centered, holy perspective. Holy perspective is to see the world through the eyes of eternity, as we've been talking about through summer and into James. And James compares this holy life to a test or a competition. But this test he's talking about is less like a paper test, which they did not have, but more like an endurance test, like a wrestling or running or swimming, any kind of a sport. We learn that to live, we need to live rightly. We're going to hear this a couple of times, to live rightly. And if we live rightly, we'll gain a crown. And this crown is no ordinary crown, but the crown of life itself. And is promised only to those who do not just love him, but those who endure to the end and finish the race in that love. And this understanding of God's rewards and kingdom is so amazing and so eye-opening for us. And, and it stumbles many of us. Because we, we see this and we start to think, maybe we're earning this salvation, but as we'll see in a little bit, you're not. But it's so eye-opening that we'll see that there are martyrs that talk about the crown of life. We'll see that there are Christians all the way back to the first century talk about the crown of life. And even the book of Revelation and Jesus Christ himself talk about the crown of life in the book of Revelation. So let's explore this verse. First it says, a man who endures trials is blessed because when he passes the test is the first little part of that sentence, which leads us to point number one. We see that James is telling us that those who endure will pass the test. Will pass the test. He doesn't say if they pass the test. He says when they pass the test. And God wants us to, com to, complete, to be complete people. To be complete, and in older versions of the Bible, like King James would say to become perfect. And this only comes through endurance. And endurance is a word here. That's translated as perseverance or steadfastness, if you have a different kind of Bible. If you have an ESV, if you're reading the Bible in the pew, it'll say steadfastness, I think, or perseverance. But these are all the exact same Greek word, a single word. And that word means to suffer something painful or difficult patiently and or to remain in existence to last. To remain in existence, to go as far as you can. We're not to give up. We are to endure to the end despite everything that the world throws at us. Bruce Lee says this, said this, Do not pray for an easy life. Pray for the strength to endure a difficult one. And we could ask you, Bruce, why? Why would you say that? Why would we not just pray for an easy life? The reality is, is the exact same answer that James would give, is that that's a nonsense. Suffering is inevitable. Everybody's going to suffer, will suffer, or has suffered. We'll all be tested. 
But James promises that those who endure in faith to the end will pass the test. And the reality is that testing is part of life itself. No one is exempt from being tested. And like all real tests, this one is scored. And this one's a pass-fail test. Another author, he's a theologian, J. Walters here, he says, everyone will be tested. Testing is part of life itself. No one is exempt. And like all real tests, this one is scored. It's graded. Another author writes this, talking about perseverance. says, there is no alternative to perseverance for those who follow the true religion. Now, the word religion has a lot of negative connotations today, but true religion is a real relationship with Jesus Christ. That's true religion. A relationship with God that affects your life. That's a real relationship. That's true religion. That's what they're talking about. This is a willingness to persevere, to endure to the end. And it's implied, if you're a Christian, it's implied the moment you accept Christ. It's implied that you will love the Lord until the day you die. Just like when you get married. It says, till death do you part. It's implied in the marriage covenant. Look at Hebrews here, the author writes, Therefore, since we have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us, saying the things that hold us back from running this race. He says, let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, comparing our life to a race, keeping our eyes on Jesus, who's the prize, the source and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that lay before him endured the cross and despised the shame and has sat down at the right hand of God's throne. Hebrews. This leads us to point number two. To endure is to be like Christ. To endure is to be like Christ. The goal of our faith is to stand firm in God's love. So many times people get so discouraged because they don't see their lives progressing as fast as they'd like. They struggle with drugs or alcohol or any kind of other sin, and they look at their lives, and they look at the lives of others, and they go, I'm not making any progress. But the thing is, is that progress is the expectation. That's it. To endure is to be like Christ. We'll never be completely perfect and holy as Jesus is, ever. But that's not, that's not the goal. The goal is actually just to endure and become more and more like Jesus every day. The author of, of Hebrews tells us to keep our eyes on Jesus, meaning we are to use him as our example. And just as he endured the cross and the shame and the ridicule and the pain, he sat at the right hand of God, we're called to endure this life, all of its pain and all of its suffering with the right attitude, to endure this pain, and then we will be crowned with the crown of life. Richardson, another theologian, he writes, the guiding principle of this entire first chapter is right understanding of wisdom. Right understanding means a life that puts faith and action together. Belief and action together. Right understanding means putting the promise of God ahead of the cares of this life and receiving assurance of the life to come beyond death. Right understanding about wise action is blessedness. That is the blessedness that we're looking forward to. Anything can be endured with this wisdom because the reward of divine life has been secured for the believer by Christ. And according to James, our reward for right understanding and right living is the crown of life. Given to, to the one who perseveres and endures and passes this test. This is our blessing. So what's this crown? What is this crown? And we're like, crown of life, crown of life. Well, this is point number three. This is not a crown of a king or queen. This is the crown of an Olympian. James has the crown of an Olympian in his mind when he's talking about the crown of life. He's not talking about kings and queens or princes or princesses. He's talking about the Olympian. The one who endures the race. Consider this. Paul tells us in Romans 9, 24 to 27, if you're taking notes, he says, don't you know that, a runner in a, that runners in a stadium all race, but only one receives a prize? He says, run in such a way to win the prize. Now, everyone who competes exercises self-control in everything. However, they do it to receive a crown that will fade away, the, the laurel wreath. But we, a crown that will never fade away. 
He says, therefore, do not run like one who runs aimlessly or box like one beating the air. He says, that's pointless. You don't go out into a boxing match and punch at nothing. He says, you, if you're in a boxing match, you punch your opponent. He says, you don't go out there and waste your time. Instead, I discipline my body and bring it under strict control so that, every pre so that after preaching to others, I myself will not be disqualified. That was one of Paul's fears. We've been learning that wisdom is a matter of skill, not intelligence. And skills are honed and practiced. Wisdom must be tested and proved. And part of practicing wisdom is striving to daily look past how we feel and endure what life throws at us for the sake of Christ. And each trial, even small ones, help us to develop wisdom. We can't forget that this starts with a simple matter of perspective. Some people look at this and they see good. Some people look at this and they see the word evil. It's a matter of perspective. And we're commanded to look at the world through Christ's perspective. To see the world as God sees it because that's the true perspective. We're called to see all our struggles as opportunities to grow and to mature. This is a lifelong ordeal. It's a lifelong process because we can always learn more and grow more and mature more. We all can, every one of us. And this is right. Because our daily devotion to see life's struggles as opportunities is how we win and how we endure. As we learn this wisdom, it protects us from forgetting why we're here and the God we worship. And some people will say, well, how could I possibly forget God? How could I possibly forget God? But the, the problem is, is that throughout history, the Bible is full of times where God's people forgot the God of their salvation. Isaiah 17, 10, he says, You have forgotten the God of your salvation. You failed to remember the rock of your strength. And God goes on to explain how they're going to continue to live and plant and have children and build towns and cities. He says, but it'll all come to nothing because they forgot the purpose for living, which is God, and to grow God's kingdom, to spread God's love. God says to us again, I, I am the one who comforts you. Who are you that you should fear man who dies? Or, a, or the son of man who's given up like grass? You have forgotten the Lord, your maker, who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth. When despair and hate grip us, we must realize, admit, and repent of the fact that we've forgotten God's love at that point. We've forgotten the God of our salvation. We worship a God of love and grace and mercy and peace. Despair and hate are not from the Lord. If we feel that in our heart, it's not from God. And we need to recognize it immediately and repent of it. To cast it aside. To daily focus on Christ and run the race well. To correct our path. And God promises in Isaiah 44, he says, Remember these things, Jacob and Israel, for you are my servant. He says, I formed you. You are my servant. Israel, you are, will never be forgotten by me. And remember, we talked about again weeks ago, Israel, we are Israel. Those who love God are Israel. That's what Paul tells us. God will never forget us or reject us, but that doesn't mean that we can't forget or reject him. Paul tells us in Philippians, he says, So then, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in you, enabling you both to desire and to work out his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling and arguing. He's saying have a right attitude about the things that you're going through, so that you may be blameless and pure, children of God who are faultless and are crooked and perverted generation, among whom you shine like the stars in the world. Do we live in a perverse generation? Do we live in a crooked world? Anybody? This is where you respond. Is anybody going to vote? We're all going to feel dirty the next day. Okay? This is a crooked and perverse generation. And we are supposed to shine like the stars in the heavens in a dark and dirty place. 
We see we do not compete for a crown that you get once and for all. We compete for a crown that every single day, in a very real sense, we can claim. Every single day, daily, we work out our salvation with fear and trembling in this life right now. Everything that we do, we're supposed to do it without grumbling or complaining or arguing because we want God to be glorified through it. Every single thing we do is an opportunity to claim a victory in the name of Jesus. Like the Olympians in the Greek days, they won a single laurel crown for their competition. This is why it's important to know what kind of crown we're talking about. But here's the thing. This doesn't mean that they've arrived or they're done. As soon as they get the laurel crown, as soon as they've won the race, they've won the day, what do they do? They prepare for the next one. They continue to prepare because they know there's always going to be another battle, another race, another boxing match. Forever until the day the Lord calls them home. And Christians, we are supposed to be the same way. Every single day is a new opportunity to claim Christ. To claim victory over the things that we're going through. This is the life we're called to live. And it's a joy-filled, blessed life because we have meaning. Every single one of us, no matter where we're at in our lives, if you're stuck in a wheelchair, if you can walk, or if you can, can't hear, or you can't see, whatever it is, every single day is a victory for the Christian. We go to bed at night, we lay down and go, God, I've won. I've won. Now I'm going to go to bed. Help me sleep. Every single day is an opportunity to grow and mature and to grow in the love of God and spread that love. Jesus tells us in Revelation, just a warning Jesus gives us here. He says, I know your works, your labor, and your endurance. You cannot tolerate evil. That's part of enduring the race, not tolerating evil. It says, you have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not. And you found them to be liars. And Jesus is telling them that right living is the bar. And that evil should not be tolerated in their lives or in the lives of their pastors or their teachers. This is important because those we trust and those we look up to, they can warp our perspective of reality. Those books that we read and the things we pour ourselves into, they can warp our perspective of how we see the world. Just think about that. How many people do we have, pastors and politicians and people on TV and the newspapers, all, this different, all these different people, all this different media, trying to convince us to think like they do? Every single day. We're called to not let the world infect us. Jesus continues in 2.10, he says, he, conti he continues, don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. Look, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison to test you. And you will have affliction for 10 days, but be faithful until death, and I will give you what? The crown of life. The crown of life. And Jesus is telling us that suffering is inevitable. Some will suffer a lot, some will suffer a little, but all will suffer. And how you deal with that suffering Depends on how much you love the Lord, really. Do you trust what God teaches? Do you trust what Scripture says? The person who firmly trusts the Lord is not going to fear death. That's why, he's, that's why Paul tells us, says, why are you afraid of who can hurt you? Why, that's why God says in Isaiah, who are you afraid of? Psalm 27, whom shall you be afraid? If the Lord is for you, whom, whom shall you be afraid of? You love the Lord. Walter's here, Walter's here, he says this. He says, this has always been the hope of the weary pilgrim. That's us. Pilgrims are those who are going from one place to another. And we are on our path to heaven, our true home. He says in the book of Revelation, Christ gives this promise to the persecuted church. And he reads Revelation 2.10. 2, uh, he says, unlike wealth and earthly possessions, the blessing of true religion will never pass away. We see again that we are not competing for a literal crown made of gold and silver, but rather we are fighting for the crown of life itself. We're fighting to live and to live right. That's what we're fighting for. Point number four is, this is a blessing that every Christian can know, how to truly live and how to live to the fullest. 
No matter where we are, if we're in prison, we can claim victory there because we're Christians. You guys, have re- if you ever read these letters, I'm, I'm reading the letters of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a, uh, was a pastor in Germany during Hitler's reign. And he fought against Hitler and was put in prison for trying to kill Hitler. And then we have this, this book of letters to, from him to his parents while he's in prison. Knowing full well he's going to die. He was in a concentration camp with the very Jews he was defending. And we see this hope in the writings of a man who was condemned. Only Christ can provide that kind of hope and confidence. We need to change our perspective and see our crown in heaven as the most important goal in our lives. The crown in heaven. If heaven is where our happiness lies, we will, find hap- we will not find happiness in earthly things. Because here's the thing, everything we have will eventually go away. John Calvin writes it like this, he says, If then it be your chief happiness to be crowned in the kingdom of heaven, and it should be, it follows that the contest with which the Lord tries us are aids and helps to our happiness. Think about that. 2 Timothy, Paul tells us, This saying is trustworthy. For if you've died with Christ, with him, you will also live with him. It's a promise. If you endure, you will reign with him. It's a promise. If you deny him, if we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. For he cannot deny himself. We're called to identify with Christ in this life here and now because our real residence is already in heaven. This is our hope in the resurrection. This is a hard thing for us to wrap our minds around. But consider this. If you've repented, if you've already accepted God's grace and mercy, you've already died to your sins. You are already spiritually raised from the dead because in the end, Christ has already won for us. This is a hard thing for us to think about. It's a hard thing for us to understand. So Paul, he explains it in Romans here. He says, Are you unaware that all of us who were baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in a new way of life. But here's the thing. The new way of life is now. He's talking about now. The new way of life is now. The resurrection is a real, daily occurrence for us. It's today. It matters now. Our hope is in the resurrection of the future. We're already died to our sins, raised from the dead. This is the purpose of baptism. The symbolism, I should say, of baptism. Symbolism of baptism is you are above the water. You go underwater. You are buried and dead. Jesus rose from the dead. That is our hope. And what happens? We rise from the dead as well, spiritually reborn. Born again believers is what we call ourselves. That's the symbolism of baptism. We come out of the water. We're born again, resurrected in the name of Jesus Christ. We're just waiting for the day when we physically die to have that fulfilled. And as we learned last week, the rich man is to see his stuff as nothing because He's already died to the world. We've already died to the world. Nothing here really matters in the big scheme of things. It's the relationships and those we love that matter. They're the only things that in our life will go to heaven with us. Our children, our friends, our family. My cup. A Wisconsin cup, by the way. Will not go to heaven with me. Sadly. Praise God. There's always one. But the cup, the podium, the tablet, this church, all the stuff that we put so much stock into, the trees and the pews, and people will fight over what color the carpet is. None of this stuff is going to go to heaven. We're arguing over all kinds of other things, and nothing matters. A pastor, a really great pastor, he had gone into a church. They put in brand new carpet. And it was during the 60s and 70s, and all these hippies were coming in, and they were wearing their bare feet, and they were filthy. And the, and the elders said, you know what? We need to make a rule. No shoes, no service. 
and he goes, well, that's easy. Let's tear the carpet out. And the guy says, wait, we just put in that carpet. It's brand new. He says, wait a second, you're telling me that the carpet is going to stop people from hearing the gospel? That's an easy choice. Tear out the carpet. And how many times do we as Christians do the exact same things, focus on stuff that does not matter? I was talking to to uh, folks out here in the hallway and just talking about all these different landmines that we run into with churches and Christians and just people in general. And a friend of mine, he had a church where he came in every pew and every single window had a plaque. So if you wanted to replace a pew, you had to make somebody's great-great-grandson very angry. He wanted to take the giving box down and just have a, pass a plate. And somebody says, whoa, my great-grandpa donated that box. Really? Are we really going to fight over the box or the window? Or why are we putting our names on things? Jesus, I'm so awesome. Donated by Joshua. Which anybody knows. <laughs> Piano. I paid to get it tuned. It sounds awesome. Why would we do that? The thing is, is we're focusing on the wrong things. And as the poor person, the poor person, we're supposed to be boasting in our exaltation. Yeah, we don't have much. I gotta fix my own car, I gotta fix my own siding, I gotta fix my own stuff, but praise God, it doesn't matter anyway because I'm the son of the king. God's perspective. And we as believers are simply called to live out the spiritual truth as a reality. This sounds like a tall order. It says, How can we possibly persevere and be that strong? I mean, how many of us feel that strong to be able to stand up every single day and stand up for Christ? Not very many of us. But we must remember that perfection is completion. Perfection we are called to is maturity. We're called to endurance. That's what we're called to. We can't forget that oftentimes we fail and fall, every single one of us. So we're not called to live perfect, sinless lives. We're called to get back up when we fall down. This, uh, this theologian here, Richardson, he says, approval does not entail a faultless endurance as if sinlessness were expected. Rather, it acknowledges a faith that perseveres in the love of God, who promises life. This test we're living through is a pass-fail. We're not being graded as if we can earn salvation. You, you can't do good enough to get into heaven. There's no C-. minus. And you're probably thinking about somebody who probably is going to get a C-. minus. But there are no C minuses, I promise. John Calvin, he says this. This is great. He says, but they reason absurdly who hence infer that we are fighting to merit the crown. He's saying people are being ridiculous, absurd to believe you can earn that crown. You can't earn it. He says God has gratuitously appointed it to us. He says we are only fighting because it renders us fit to receive it. We can't earn salvation or be good enough. Because if that was the bar, none of us would make it. Which is the point number five, last point. James is not teaching us that we, that we are earning salvation or earning grace. As Calvin explains, we are only striving to be fit to receive it. We're striving to be fit to receive it. I'll confess something right now. I don't deserve the wife I have. Thank you, Bruce, for that nugget of encouragement. He said, you sure don't. I don't deserve my wife. I know I don't deserve my wife. I don't deserve the stuff I have. I don't deserve my family. But I'll tell you right now, that knowledge of knowing I don't deserve my wife makes me get on my knees every day and pray to God to give me the strength to be worthy of it. I don't deserve to be the pastor of this church. Thank you. And there are many people who are way more qualified than me to be here. Let's be honest. Shut up, Jim. I was waiting for Jim to say something. You're looking at me. And I'm, he's like, well, I can think of a couple, but I mean, you know, off the top of my head. But the point is that there are many people who could do this job better, who are better qualified, have more degrees, are more personable, better looking, probably. But the thing is, is that knowing that, makes me struggle and strive and try so hard to be fit to be your pastor. When somebody calls me pastor, I take that very seriously. I want to be 
worthy of that admiration, of that title. We do not deserve God's grace or this life in general. How many people here deserve the life you have? Be honest with yourself. Think about it. If you don't deserve the life you have, why are you living as if you do? As if you're entitled? As if you're owed anything? If you knew for a fact that you don't deserve the life you have, you would live this life to the fullest to be worthy of the life that God has blessed you with. And that's the thing. When the world knocks us down, when sin creeps into our lives, when anger takes us over, when addiction or pain or ridicule or whatever comes into our lives and we fall, the Christian gets back up. It's not because we're strong enough, because we're not. It's not because we're intelligent enough, because we're not. It's not because we're good enough, because we're not. We are already victors. We have already conquered. We are more than conquerors, Scripture says. Romans 8, Paul gives this big long list of questions. He says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? You guys, that's us. Who can condemn us? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, our hopes in the resurrection. He's at the right hand of the Father. He is interceding for us. Who or what can separate us from the love of Christ? What's his answer? Nothing. No one. He says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come. Nothing in the future, nothing in the past. Your past doesn't matter. Your future is just the future. Nothing, no powers, no height, nor depth, nothing, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. If that doesn't warrant an amen, I don't know what does. We get up, because winners don't stay down. We get up because winners don't stay down. We're commanded to live this life in this way, to boast in our exaltation. Daughters and sons of the king don't stay down. Do you really know where you've come from? And do you really know you don't deserve where you are? If you're the son or daughter of a king, you walk around like it. You stand up. And you persevere like it. Because God has already done the work for us. There's this Jewish book of wisdom. The early Christians and Jewish believers in the first century read and, and uh, looked to for wisdom. It says the fear of the God, the fear of the Lord is honor and glory and gladness and a crown of rejoicing. The fear of the Lord makes a heart merry and gives joy and gladness in a long life. Brothers and sisters, claim your prize. Put on your crown of rejoicing today, every day. Wake up every morning and thank God for the life you don't deserve. Thank God for the car that's broken down because you don't deserve a broken down car. Thank God for the house that leaks and has all these issues because you know what? You don't deserve a house that leaks and has all kinds of issues. You don't deserve anything. Put on that crown of rejoicing because the price has already been paid. The fight is over. The war is already won. We're already victors. Amen. So when James says we're victors and he talks about this, we know we're victors. We, more, we know we're more than conquerors. And the point is, as James is trying to teach us, says, now that you know, live like it. Live like you believe what God has told you. Let's pray. Father, thank you again so much, Lord, for your grace, your mercy, for your word, for James. Lord, the book of James, the letter of James, is such a great point of divergence from all the theology and all the things that we argue about as Christians, and James just gets down to the nuts and bolts of our faith. He gets past all the petty arguments and all the stuff we argue about with our brothers and sisters, Lord, and, and others as well, and he gets right to the point. We're supposed to live the love that you have shown us. 
I pray, God, that you would help all of us here to grow in maturity. Lord, you promise that if we ask for wisdom, you will provide that wisdom. Lord, why don't we pray for wisdom more often? Please, God, convict our, our hearts and help us to grow in this faith that you've blessed us with. You've already won. Just help us to live like we've already won as well. In Jesus' name, amen.